ProPublica um, recently published the, the results of an almost year-long investigation uh, into the literal combat ship, which was supposed to be um, a, a ship that the Navy was going to rely on as a very technically advanced uh, ship that could fight in close sh to shore, which is what littoral means. Um, and Joaquin reported on that story, um, interviewing tons of people, going through reams of documents. This is a story that's been 20 years in the making. Um, so I'll just kind of kick it off uh, this, this live session by asking Joaquin, uh, it has been two decades since the ship's been around. There's been stories written before. Uh, what was it that made you want to kind of dive a little deeper into the story? Yeah, well, that, that actually was part of it. Uh, the, the ship's been around for, for 20 years now, and in that time, there's been dozens of reports from places like the Government Accountability Office, uh, various you know, IG reports, the Department of Testing and Evaluation, and the Pentagon, uh, congressional hearings, news stories about how uh, poorly these ships are working. Um, but what hadn't really been done yet was to sort of show the complete history of how and why uh, the Navy made these decisions to continue to build them and invest so heavily and just keep doubling down again and again on these ships that had such obvious shortcomings. And so our ambition really was to you know, trace the entire history of the program from its conception to uh, the construction, uh, to the deployments of the ships, to many of the breakdowns that uh, befell these ships so that we could understand how exactly these things happen. Right. right. So we did a lot of synthesizing, in other words, of, of all the strands to kind of deliver the big picture overview of how this ship um, came to be and, and why it is that it's now um, being, many of them are being sent to mothball uh, early. So let's just kind of go over the, the, that part of it. Why don't you tell about what the idea was but behind the littoral combat ships and what the end result was? Sure. So early on, the idea was that the Navy in the early 2000s needed to expand its presence in, as you said, shallow waters all over the world. Uh, there was a demand for the Navy to have uh, a greater footprint in the Persian Gulf, especially to help with the war in Iraq and uh, help deal with uh, the, Repub the, the Iranian Republican Guard, um, and also to op be able to operate in the Caribbean and deal with drug runners and uh, gun runners in that area and also to work with smaller allied navies in Southeast Asia. And so the thinking at the time was that the Navy was going to need a ship that could help do that because the ships that it had uh, were sort of too heavy and lumbering to get too close to shore. And uh, this was a real um, vulnerability uh, for the U.S. Navy. The USS Cole uh, was, was had a big hole blown into it uh, through what's sort of called the asymmetric threat, um, an attack on a, uh, a speedboat that was had explosives on it. And so uh, there was a strong desire to try and counter that. And, and at the same time, uh, there were a number of functions that they needed this ship to be able to achieve. Uh, so they wanted the ship to be able to hunt and destroy submarines wanted the ship to be able to hunt and destroy uh, underwater mines, which are really important to maintain safe shipping around the world. And they also wanted the ship to be able to uh, fight other warships. And so the thinking was that you could do all three of those missions with just one ship, and they could come in and be very quickly transformed to accomplish their next mission. And the person that had this idea in mind. It's a, a former chief of naval operations, Vernon Clark, and his thinking was these ships were going to be able to go in and, you know, like a NASCAR sort of speed race, um, get fixed up, outfitted, and go out to their next mission. Um, part He gained confidence that this idea was going to work when he saw 
uh, a Danish demonstration of uh, sort of a similar form of technology called the Stanflex, which is a very quick, small modular ship that the, that the Danish Navy had. And so his thinking was, well, if they can do it, we can do it. Um, and as it turned out, that, that turned out to be wrong. Um, you know, the, the mine warfare capability is really just in its um, initial phases still, even after 20 years, they just reached initial operating capability. Um, the surface uh, warfare equipment that the ship has is, is you know, mostly just to protect the ship itself. Um, and they've given up altogether on the anti-submarine module. Uh, and that's part of the reason why the Navy now wants to decommission these ships. So let's talk about those, those different weapon systems for a second. Um, for each of them, can you talk about a little bit what the idea was and then what actually happened to it? You know, the idea of having a, almost a kind of a Lego block ability to kind of plug in and plug out um, sounds like it's not a bad idea. But in, in practice, can you tell us a little bit about like what happened with each of those different systems? Like what are they actually supposed to look like and then what happened to them? Sure, so they were gonna have what's called plug and play technology um, where just like it sounds, you'd be able to bring the ship in, it's got open architecture and then you could install uh, equipment uh, that could do whatever you needed it to do. And each of these uh, missions though were extraordinarily complicated um, and so, like I said, there's mine warfare, there's anti-submarine warfare, and there's anti-surface warfare in order to fight other ships, other warships. And so um, for the anti-submarine and the mine countermeasures in particular, the idea was they're gonna have uh, sonar devices that they could control off the back, uh, off the stern of the ship. In one case, it was a, an, a, a mini submarine uh, that could go out and find mines you'd send a signal back to the ship, and then you'd send something out to go and destroy the mine. Um, and for the submarine, there was a drag sonar device that could detect other mines in the water. It would feed information back to the ship. The ship would send a signal to a helicopter, which would then drop another uh, sonar into the ocean, find the submarine, and then drop a torpedo to go and destroy it. Uh, so among the many issues that these devices had was that they had difficulty uh, communicating one another with one another and which you can imagine it's a really important part of making all of this work. Um, another issue that they had was that they had a lot of difficulty um, functioning in the large wake left behind a littoral combat ship because these ships are almost like a giant jet ski. They're, they're, they're operating on the plane of the water with, um, without the sort of propeller propulsion that most ships have. They actually do have uh, jet streams. Uh, and so they're up on the surface of the water, they leave this big wake, and that makes it really hard to control some of these devices that they wanted to hang off the back of the ship to, to accomplish some of these missions. Um, and so, you know, we spoke with somebody who was involved in uh, developing these modules uh, for you know, the, basically the entire course of his career in and out of the Navy as both a civilian uh, and in uniform. And, um, and, you know, the way that he sort of described it is that, you know, without these mission modules, the, the ship is basically like a box floating in the ocean. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of where we are with the LCS at the moment. Um, we're still waiting on its mine uh, fighting capability anti-surface is in place and they've given up on on being able to fight subs altogether. I mean some of those things sound so so complex it sort of boggles the mind a little bit about you know why it was that the Navy thought they would work in the first place um, but can you tell me like were there were there warning signs were there moments when um, people said either inside the Navy or outside the Navy uh, you know what's going on with these ships they're, they're they're not working as they should were there any kind of questions that were raised about about that? So that's one of the interesting aspects of this story is that there were a lot of questions raised uh, through these internal and external uh, investigations. Uh, some of these were assigned to senior officers in the Navy who had the task of 
doing a deep analysis of the LCS to try and figure out how to make it work or whether it can work. And um, a couple of those analysis came back negative, <laughs> basically suggesting we should curtail the program altogether. And in both the cases that we looked at, uh, not only did the Navy fail to heed the advice that was in these investigations, but the authors of those investigations saw their careers derailed as a result. And so it wound up creating this kind of chilling effect where if you spoke out against the LCS during a certain time period, uh, you were going to run into trouble. Uh, and the consequences could be pretty severe for your personal professional career path. And, and when we went out to report this, or you, you and I had all kind of discussions about um, the folks we were talking to and the need for anonymity for a lot of them. So it, even so, for, I was always struck by how it continued post a career, there was still a real desire to kind of um, keep quiet about things. So, you know, how did we, how, did we, how do we end up sort of like kind of getting over uh, those humps and how do you make connections with these folks who obviously showed, uh, you know, some hesitancy, some, some nervousness about talking years after they'd even left the Navy? Yeah, I think there was important to show that we were willing to make the investment in both time and resources to really try and understand uh, what happened here and to sh tell the story with the degree of, you know, sensitivity and nuance, um, but also uh, by holding the, the desire to hold the right people accountable that I think spoke to a lot of the people that ultimately wound up participating, uh, whether they were on the record or not. Um, I have to say that the series that you and uh, Megan Rose and Robert Fatarecci did um, a few years ago turned out to be a great calling card. Um, and you know, even though that was a, a series that was quite critical of Navy leadership, there were a lot of people who said, you know, you guys got it right that time, and so I'm going to talk to you again. Um, and so that that helped a lot. Uh, but you know, those fears that you're talking about are real, uh, even for people, as you said, who've left the Navy, because a lot of them continue to work with the US military in one way or the other. People go on to work as defense contractors or they're working at you know, universities or any number of other things where they, their, their concern was, well, if I call out the wrong person, uh, this is gonna affect me and my livelihood going forward, even though I'm not in uniform anymore. Louder will get you everywhere, you know. <laughs> so what's, what's that? I said flattery, flattery will get you everywhere. Yeah, with, so, with my host. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Um, all right, so people are warning the Navy. People are raising concerns about whether or not these things are worth it. Um, why didn't they, uh, why, why, why weren't their warnings heated? What, what was kind of propel, propelling along this project, even though there was kind of alarm bells going off? Well, one of the things that we found was that um, once these programs of this scale uh, and this investment uh, get going, they can be extraordinarily difficult to stop. They take on uh, a degree of momentum that, you know, is, it seems sort of impervious to, to logic uh, and to, to, to reason and to even these really obvious systemic problems. And there's, there's a bunch of complicated reasons for why that's so, but um, I think a lot of it boils down to, one was you know, personal ambition and people who were passionate about this program, really wanting to kind of defy the odds and, and make it work and really being true believers that it, that it could work and it could serve important needs for the Navy. Uh, and then also you have members of Congress who represent districts where these ships are either produced or uh, maintained, uh, or they build parts for them. And it is, you know, the, those lawmakers have uh, enormous interest in protecting those jobs that these ships create. And so they advocated very strongly uh, at the highest levels even writing to President Trump, for instance, uh, and insisting that um, the White House add more ships to the budget 
after it had been submitted to Congress in order to keep these jobs going in what are pretty important, uh, pretty politically important parts of the country. And so those two, between those two things, what you wind up with is a program that's lasted for 20 some odd years now, even though you can go back to the early 2010s and see uh, these really embarrassing breakdowns occurring over and over and over again. And let's name some names here. Who were the people who were the big proponents who kind of kept this thing going, even when there were obvious signs of trouble with the program? So a couple names pop up. I mean, I mentioned earlier that uh, CNO Vernon Clark um, really had a vision uh, for what this ship could do. Uh, he was one of its earliest proponents. Um, and then later on, uh, a lot of key decisions were made uh, by Secretary of the Navy, Ray Mabus, who wanted to uh, expand the program. Uh, there was a plan in place uh, at that time to get the Navy to be well over 300 ships. It got to be a plan to build 355 ships at one point. Um, and certainly he wanted very much to build as many ships um, as he could. And things were set up uh, to build littoral combat ships in these two shipyards in Alabama and in Wisconsin. And so he uh, very much wanted to see this program continue uh, and pushed for it in, a, in what turned out to be a pretty um, you know, shrewd and, and, and calculating way. Talk then about some of the best writing in the story um, was about the, the string of incidents that happens in the summer of 2016. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about the, um, what occurred and the significance of that time period, not just the summer, but around in the year of 2016. What kind of happened then and what lessons did you draw from that? So that was a really important year for the program. Um, this was the year that the ships began to enter the fleet and participate in exercises uh, around the world um, that are important for the Navy, for naval strategy and to show their, its, its power. Uh, and the first of these incidents uh, occurred in 2015 uh, with the USS Milwaukee, which was on its way uh, eventually uh, to California and then the South China Sea after a stop in Mayport to do more testing. And it never made it halfway down the East Coast before a software failure damaged its combining gear and it had to be uh, dragged in some 40 miles into, you know, by a Navy salvage ship uh, to be repaired in, in Norfolk. And so, so that was the first breakdown um, that happened in that year. The second one involved the USS Fort Worth, which was actually on an otherwise pretty successful deployment um, in Singapore, uh, working with allied navies. It had worked to, to, on a, a rescue of an Indonesian commercial plane crash, and, uh, but it was being run uh, sort of to the ground. Um, and one of the things that we learned in that investigation is that the sailors who were on it were just completely exhausted by that deployment, um, which is one of the consequences that you'll see of a, of a ship with this kind of um, technology on it and this kind of responsibility uh, being served on by just 40 people. Everybody on it is wiped out. And so, um, so unfortunately, the sailors in that instance skipped a routine step. They failed to properly lubricate the combining gear and they caused some pretty serious damage and it took the Navy about seven months to repair it. Uh, so that was number two. Uh, the third one uh, took place on the USS Freedom. Uh, they went out to participate in the Rim of the Pacific exercise, which is an enormously consequential. It's the biggest naval exercise uh, that's held. And, um, and so all eyes were kind of watching. It was meant to demonstrate its ability to go out and find mines. Um, there was a seawater leak that takes place inside the the main machinery, main machinery room in that ship. And so there's just water spraying all over all of this electrical equipment. Um, they bring the ship back in. They do a procedure that they think is going to call it, fix the problem. As it turns out, it doesn't. And yet they decide to take that ship back out again anyway, um, in part because of all of the pressure to perform 
and the idea was that they could just rely on their three other engines. Well, they bring it back and they discover that um, that one engine that was contaminated was, was now severely corroded and had to be replaced, which was another very, very costly mistake. Um, so then there's, there's two more uh, over the course of that year, uh, or at least two other ships were involved. One was heading out to Singapore from uh, Hawaii, had to turn back. Uh, and another one um, hit some locks in the Panama Canal, struck another tug, uh, struck a tugboat, um, and had just kind of a disastrous five weeks uh, in that part of the world. And so what that you know time period really showed was put on full display some of the many you know mechanical and crewing uh, issues that these ships had. Um, and it turned out to be, you know, uh, a, a year where the Navy learned quite a lot about the limits of these ships. All right. So we want to get to viewer questions in a second. If we could wrap up, you know, where, what is the status of the uh, LCS program today? Like what's going on with them? So last year, uh, the Navy tried to decommission nine of the ships. They were able to decommission only four because Congress blocked it, uh, blocked half of them from being retired. Uh, and, and those are, those are happening as we speak. The Sioux city was retired last month. Uh, the USS Milwaukee was retired just within the last few days. Um, and there's, there's a couple of more that are scheduled to be retired this year. And the Navy is asked, uh, to retire two more, uh, both independence class ships, uh, next year. And so we'll, we'll see whether that happens. In the meantime, you know, the Navy is, is trying to put these ships that they still have on missions that they can actually handle. Um, but, you know, there seems to be, I mean, certainly from the response that we were getting from the Navy to our questions, there, it wasn't the most robust defense of the ship. Um, they're acknowledging that it's got pretty serious flaws and they're basically saying this doesn't do us much good against our top line priority right now, which is China. And so we are better off retiring these ships and investing the money elsewhere than continuing to try and make them work against a peer that we really don't think that they would be capable of fighting anyway. Right. So these are ships that, that, that were designed to last 20 years that are being put to bed after five, 10 years. Each one cost $500 million. What's the long-term total overall cost of this program? So we worked with an analyst that the our former government accountability office an, analyst uh, who was able to help us figure out exactly what that was. And the estimate that he, that, that he showed us was that it could reach a hundred billion dollars or more. So, but that figure, you know, takes into account basically everything, the mission modules, the people serving on the ship, the maintenance, the cost to actually decommission the ship when that time comes. And so depending on how long this program lasts, uh, that's, that's the price tag that we're looking at, 100 billion or more. It could be less than that if the Navy decides we're gonna, you know, get, and gets permission to, you know, decommission a, a larger number of these sooner. Um, but that's, that's, you know, it's, it's looking like a potentially a uh, hundred billion or more dollar program. A well, hundred billion dollars. All right, let's get some questions from our audience. Um, we love to hear from ProPublica um, readers and viewers. Um, a question's come in about who has, who is the responsible for oversight of this, sh uh, this line of ships ultimately? And have there been any real consequences? Yeah, so responsibility lies with, with Congress and it lies with the Defense Department uh, to some degree. Uh, but certainly, you know, we have uh, oversight committees in Congress that are supposed to be monitoring this stuff. And, you know, over the years, some members have really uh, gone, to, gone to task trying to hold the Navy to account for uh, some of the, 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 the cost overruns. Uh, as we detail in our story, you know, John McCain um, was uh, very much opposed to this program and would period periodically, you know, grill Navy officials about the skyrocketing, skyrocketing costs and the mechanical breakdowns. 
uh, of course, he's he's now uh, passed away. Um, but there are others who have been, you know, uh, also very critical of these shifts. Um, but at the same time, you have other forces on those same committees uh, that are big advocates for those shifts. And they tend to be people who represent districts, again, where the ships or their parts are being made. So um, we've got the Navy, we've got the Department of Defense. Another player uh, in this is, is the defense contracting industry, the folks who built these ships. Um, do we have any idea uh, about where blame lies with them? Uh, you know, what did, did, did they do, or if they did anything, uh, in terms of um, making the ship really not able to fulfill its duties? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. You know, the, what the Navy did and does in most cases is they put out um, requirements for these kinds of ships. They basically say, this is what we wanted the ship to do. We want it to go this fast. We want it to have this kind of capability. And so give us your best uh, ideas. And that's what the defense contractors did in this case. And they came back with some really interesting and innovative ideas. Uh, you know, early on, the, the designs were based on uh, designs for commercial or passenger ferries, which was a very unusual choice uh, for a ship, you know, meant for war, not transportation. Um, but nonetheless, those were the, the designs that were the most compelling uh, to the Navy and ultimately the Defense Department and everyone else. And that's how they wound up getting these contracts. And then they built these ships to the designs that the, you know, they had agreed on uh, with the Navy. Um, and, and so, you know, there is um, some, there's certainly some uh, responsibility there, but, you know, what they would say is, well, we built the, the, the ship that the Navy asked for. Um, and so, you know, but, you know, it, it ultimately, like one of the things that we heard from Marinette Marine, for instance, is that the, we didn't design the ship, we just built the ship. It's actually a Lockheed Martin design and we built it to uh, Navy specifications. Right. The Navy told us what to do and the, with the Navy and Congress, because they're the ones who, provide the funding and approve this whole program. So uh, if you're looking to kind of look at where the accountability lies, it really lies with the people who are spending the money and making the decisions to keep these things going, even despite these, these warning signs. Um, do you think, uh, do you have any kind of um, idea of like uh, why there hasn't been more of an outcry from, from voters about this particular program? I mean, I don't, I don't know that this is the thing that, you know, most voters on their sort of day in, day out, um, routine lives are, are following much. So I think that's probably part of it. I mean, hopefully, you know, our story changes that a little bit. Um, but um, I think it is also something that everyone, you know, we've all as Americans have something at stake here. Um, we're all, you know, paying taxes and we've all got to be uh, protected by our uh, U.S. military. And so a lot of people, um, while they might feel very removed from what's described in the story, where there, there is reason for concern. I mean, ultimately, this is our money that's being spent. Um, but, um, but, you know, these stories are also really complicated. And I mean, it took an enormous amount of time for us to be able to break this down uh, as simply as we could. Um, so I think that that is also uh, potentially part of the reason why there isn't so much, uh, you know, emphasis on this or, or attention put on this from, from voters. Yeah, right. Hard. It's very complicated to understand. And it's just not something that people are sitting around their kitchen table necessarily, you know, aware of or talking about uh, every morning. Right. And it kind of unfolds kind of slowly after, after 20 years of time. Um, uh, are there any concerns that the Navy invested sort of so heavily into the uh, littoral combat ships that they have in some that has in some way left us behind kind of our modern day peer to peer competitors like China? Yeah, that's a big concern um, from people who watch the Navy closely is that, you know, they made this huge investment into ships that aren't working um, and aren't going to do us any good against what the Pentagon has decided is our top uh, most important competitor right now, which is China. And so, 
you know, the, the exact numbers, um, I think, are there's the Chinese Navy has 340 ships and submarines at its disposal, according to the Pentagon's most recent report. Um, and we've got somewhere around 294. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions there about how much those numbers matter and our carriers are superior and things like that. But, you know, when you consider that, men, you know, 294 of those ships, many of them are now made up. I mean, there's 35, there were 35 littoral combat ships. A couple of them are still being built. We've decommissioned a few, but that's still a pretty significant chunk of the Navy. And, you know, the Navy's just said, these aren't really going to help us uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer fight. And a final uh, qu uh, question, and we'll wrap things up. Um, can you tell, are these ships still being built and what is their ultimate fate going to be? Uh, so there are a couple ships that are, I think, just finishing construction or being outfitted just now. These are the very last ships that the Navy bought. Ultimately, they decided they wanted 32. Uh, Congress wound up successfully tacking on three more and they got 35. Um, and and so now we're in this very strange period where you have the very newest of these ships entering the fleet um and at the same time they're getting rid of some that are just a few years old so that's basically the status of the program um one thing i haven't talked about that uh one of our um viewers kind of pointed out is what about the crewing of these ships can you talk a little bit about uh the size of the crews and, and what they were going through? Yeah. So early on, the idea was that there were only going to be 40 people on them, which is, you know, a drop in the bucket compared to most Navy vessels, which, which have typically hundreds. And so this really was a unique ship in that respect. And so every uh, sailor or officer on it was going to have multiple jobs. And uh, the, the calculus was, that they were actually going to rely on contractors to do much of the work that sailors and officers would normally do, help to maintain the ships and fix them and things like that. That turned out to backfire because it wound, the, the Navy wound up even sort of more beholden to these contractors because they'd have to be waiting around in order for them to arrive and help fix the ship. And we talked to many, many uh, sailors and officers who complained about how long uh, that, that could take. And um, but after some of these deployments that I had described earlier in 2015 and 16, it became pretty clear that, you know, the crew original crewing concepts weren't going to work and that they were going to have to expand the size of the crews, which they ultimately did. And they also made the ships uh, so that they were single mission. Um, and so they've given up on the idea of having swappable weapons packages altogether at this point. OK, so ultimate question here. What lessons um, did you draw from your reporting in terms of the, the Navy's investment in more innovative, what seemed at least to be at the time, innovative technologies? Yeah, so I think that there, you know, certainly one of the things that we heard quite a bit is that there's this sort of cardinal principle when it comes to Navy shipbuilding, which is to buy a few and test a lot. And so you, you kind of figure out how this thing works what its flaws are before you go out and buy um, dozens of whatever it is that you're looking at. And, you know, in this case, what we were told by former uh, Navy leaders is that we did the opposite. Uh, we bought a few. We didn't buy a few and test a lot. We bought a lot. And then by the time we got them out to the fleet, it was too late. We were learning about the, Floyd, the flaws of the ships as they were being deployed. Um, and so, you know, if we're going to make a significant investment uh, in this kind of innovative technology, again, which seems inevitable, um, then I think it's going to be really important to very thoroughly test it, you know, before, before we buy these things. And also just to be aware of, you know, how this kind of inertia develops over time, where you have lawmakers who are going to ardently support these ships almost no matter what, you're going to have people in the Navy who are going to sort of stake their careers on the success of these ships. And so, you know, there's a lot of forces at play here that make it very difficult um, to, to, to stop it, even once it's obvious that things are going wrong. And this is not the first 
you know, uh, instance of this. I mean, people have made similar comparisons to the F-35, to the Gerald R. Ford, to the future combat system. And so it is something that has popped up again and again throughout our history. And each one of those weapons programs, I think, serves as a kind of case study for the sorts of pitfalls that we really want to try to avoid uh, so we don't make these kinds of mistakes again in the future. All right. That's our time today. Uh, thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in and for supporting our work. Um, if you want to donate, it's ProPublica.org. Um, please subscribe to us on any of your favorite social media channels, be it Instagram or X, formerly known as Twitter, uh, or wherever else. Um, and if you want to, you can subscribe to our daily newsletter, which provides a summary and an update on our biggest stories at ProPublica.org slash newsletters. And that'll keep you from missing big stories like this one. So I just want to thank everybody for um, asking questions, um, reading the story, uh, and, and looking into and, be, and caring about something like this.